Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see y'all here today. Good to be together here at Community Baptist Church to worship God together. Uh, come together to worship God. I, I invite you to share your voices with these words from Psalm 22. These are the words that call us to worship today. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him, glorify him, stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For we do not despise the poor of the Lord, the rich of the afflicted. He did not hide his face. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. <clears throat> the poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship the Lord. And as we worship the Lord our God today, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Take the time now and share the peace of Christ with those around you. In the midst of this congregation, we praise you, O Lord and our God. We praise you for how mighty you are. For you are the God who created the universe, and yet you are the God who loves us intimately. And so for the nearness of your power <coughs> demonstrated to us in unmatched love, we give you our thanks and praise. In these moments as we worship, may all that we offer you be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The scripture lesson this morning is from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. I'm getting my eyes fixed in about a month. <laughs> um, until the time when we were mature enough to respond freely to faith in the living God, we were carefully surrounded and protected by the Mosaic Law. The law was like those Greek tutors with which you are familiar who would escort children to school to protect them from danger or distraction, making sure the children will really get to the place they set out for. But now you have arrived at your destination. By faith in Christ, you are in direct, direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in an adult faith of wardrobe. Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. In Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, when you are, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, heirs of the <coughs> covenant promises. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
God, you are the source of every blessing, and it's humbling to consider how richly you pour out those blessings to us over and over again as, as we take stock of our lives. We see your hand at work and how um, you have blessed us. And the simple things we notice in nature around us, how a cool breeze reminds us of your loving presence. Yes. And just the ways that we can open our eyes and, and see you all around. How our own hearts remind us that you are near. How the Holy Spirit uh, whispers an announcement of your presence. We, we indeed are grateful for all that we have, have spoken today that our thanksgivings, for all that we're reminded of even now, of, of how you have helped us. May these signs of gratitude bless us to know that we can expect no less in the days to come that you are the God who has helped us thus far, and that will be true for you <coughs> in the moments following this worship service and in the days to come, that we will lift up voices of praise to honor a God who cares for us and delivers us, a God who forgives us of our sins and does not hold our shortcomings against us. We give you thanks that Jesus Christ has made it possible for all of us to know your presence and to be reconciled in relationship with you, that this blessing prepares us to be reconciled to the world around us. Our hearts are heavy today, oh God, with, with many concerns to bear, and so for our, our prayers that accompany the sick and the struggling today, we pray for your help. May they be uh, restored to good health. May they have the help that they need uh, from medical care that's given them, from the help and support of family and friends, and from your church. We pray for and with those who grieve today, our, our thoughts and prayers are especially with David and his family. Bless them to know the comfort of your loving and abiding presence. That that would arrive in, in many ways, in the, in the comfort and care of, of family and friends who will draw near to them. In the, the unexplainable knowledge of how you show up and that they know you're there. We pray for this good congregation, for, for each of its members, for the work that we are blessed to do in all that we, we set out to do. We pray that the name of Jesus would be known, for he knows each of us and calls us by name and blesses us to be the family of God. And we pray for your family, for your children, here and everywhere, that they would know this bountiful expression of love that only comes from you. And that we would all pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Luke 8. 8, 26 through 39. 
They sailed on to the country of the Gerasens, directly opposite Galilee. As he stepped out onto land, a madman from town met him. He was a victim of demons. He hadn't worn clothes for a long time, nor lived at home. He lived in the cemetery. When he saw Jesus, he screamed, fell before him, and howled, What business do you have messing with me? You're Jesus, son of the high God, but don't give me a hard time. The man said this because Jesus had started to order the unclean spirits out of him. Time after time, the demon threw the man into convulsions. He had been placed under constant guard and tied with chains and shackles, but crazed and driven wild by the demon, he would shatter the bonds. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Mob, my name is Mob, he said, because many demons afflicted him. And they begged Jesus desperately not to order them to the bottomless pit. A large herd of pigs was grazing and rooting on a nearby hill. The demons begged Jesus to order them into the pigs. He gave the order. It was even worse for the pigs than for the man. Crazed, they stamp stampeded over a cliff into the lake and drowned. Those tending the pigs, scared to death, bolted and told their story in town and country. People went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had been sent, sitting there at Jesus' feet, wearing decent clothes and making sense. It was a holy moment, and for a short time they were more reverent than curious. Then those who had seen it happen told how the demoniac had been saved. Later, a great many people from the Jerusalem countryside got together and asked Jesus to leave. Too much changed, too fast, and they were scared. So Jesus got back in the boat and set off. The man whom he had delivered from the demons asked to go with him, but he sent them back, saying, Go home and tell everything God did in you. So he went back and preached all over town everything Jesus had done in him. This is the word of the Lord.
everybody knows me as Chip. That's not on my driver's license or my birth certificate. I've met Chips who are actually legally Chips. And I wonder about that, but I am a Chip because my real name is Emery Luther Reeves Jr. I'm a Chip off the old block. And I catch myself sounding like my dad sometimes. And then I recognize that, and I'll say out loud that my brother sounds more like my dad than I do. And then I realize that that's something that my dad would say. <laughs> but I became Chip when I was probably about four days old. One of my mother's friends, um, a friend, a parent of one of my best friends. So one of those extra mamas. Um, I guess the discussion was, if we yell, Emery, who's coming to help? Uh, maybe we need to specify which one we want. And so, you know, some nicknames were kicked around. Um, nobody wanted to be Little Emery. Thank goodness. <laughs> That's my sister's nickname. And a friend said, call him Chip. And it stuck. And so I saw her again at, at my dad's funeral last summer. And she said, you know, I helped name you, right? And I was like, that's right. That was you. <laughs> Flash forward several years, and we're adopting two boys. We go to the courthouse in Charleston, South Carolina to finalize the adoption in the, in the courtroom with the judge. And she looks down at the paperwork in front of her and looks up at me and says, I understand you are changing the boys' names. We gave each of them a family name for their middle names. And the judge says, now starting with the oldest child, Dad, tell me their name. And as I recited to the judge, Justin Daniel Reeves' name and Brandon Emery Reeves' name, I said, oh, I'm, a, I'm really adopting these boys. This is what Joseph did in Matthew when the baby is born and he calls him Jesus. He is doing the legal work of adopting Jesus. And he gives him, the, the angels told him to call him Jesus. And Jesus uh, is a Hellenized version of the name Joshua. And there were lots of Joshuas, I imagine, in Judea and Galilee at the time. And so we like to have this very Hellenized version of his name, which means God saves. And so we take the, the kind of Hellenized, the Greek version of Joshua, Jesus, and we feel like we have something that's uh, almost unique, uh, except we know a lot of friends who have a son named Jesus. And it's still the same, has the same, it carries the same meaning. God saves. This week, as we looked at Revelation 19 in, in our Bible study on Wednesday, um, there it talks about Jesus having a name that means King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's written on the back of his jersey, well, well a robe. But then it also says there, uh, he has a name that nobody knows, but he knows it. And I sit there and wonder, well, how did John know it? One of the great hymns that, that my dad liked to sing was There's Something About That Name. And in, in Revelation 19, um, there is the mention of this unknown name, yet I think we all kind of have a feeling that we know something about it. Something that really connects Jesus with God and God with Jesus. This, this unknown name. When Moses asked God his name, God said, I'll be who I'll be, and I am who I am. And that, that sounds very much like something 
my dad would tell me to do. I am who I am and I will be who I will be. And they kind of pulled that verb to be into what we would pronounce as Yahweh, um, what, our, what our Jewish friends would not pronounce because they would say the name of God is too holy. But what Jesus proved over and over again is that God will be who God will be, that God is who God is. And he demonstrated it in rich and steadfast love. So this name that we don't know is really informed by all the things that we have learned, by what we do know. In Philippians chapter 2, in that great hymn there about Jesus, where it talks about how Jesus was obedient, even um, the, how, how Jesus humbled himself and became a servant. He became obedient, even obedient unto death on a cross. And that hymn concludes with, with this, Therefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above all names, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the Jesus who has helped his disciples get across the Sea of Galilee. And in Luke chapter 8, it's, uh, there's a great storm there. And after Jesus calms the storm, people in the boat wonder, who is this? Who is this that even the winds and the water obey him? There's some more unknown name happening in that moment. This same Jesus then in that boat with his disciples lands on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Gerasenes. We can call a little town there Gadara probably. And there as they are docking the boat, <coughs> they encounter someone who knows <coughs> Jesus' name. We don't know that man's name, but he's the one yelling out to these newcomers who have crossed the lake, and he yells Jesus' name. Jesus, what do you have to do with me? We don't know the man's name. He is, has been traditionally uh, introduced to us as the garrison demoniac. And yet he still remains pretty obscure. We know a lot of facts about him. We know that he was essentially homeless. That he was cast out of his own hometown chained up in the cemetery where he would break loose from those chains. He was an outcast. He was naked and tormented. But can't we at least rationalize? Can't we at least reason? that this man was somebody's son. <clears throat> this man was somebody's child. At one time in his life, we could guess that he had a community around him, that he had a family. And yet here he is, alone and naked, Wasn't he somebody's son? And Jesus turns and asks him, What is your name? 
The important thing for us to remember uh, about our Bible stories is that to know somebody's name was very important. To know somebody's name gave you some power over that person. It's the power that I had growing up that when somebody yelled Emory, I didn't have to go. That's daddy's name. Although it came in very handy when a highway patrolman pulled me over one day and asked to see my license, and he looked at it and noticed my dad's name too. You get a warning. <laughs> Thank the Lord. But to know a person's name gave you some power over them. Just about every time somebody is named in the Bible, you get that meaning behind it. You don't have to take too many Hebrew lessons to, to hear uh, the, the suffixes and the prefixes. A lot of the prophets have a Yah in their name, a reference to God. Jesus asks this man who knew his name, what's your name? And somebody's son, tormented and naked and homeless, says, my name is Legion. Or as we heard uh, in the, the message that Robin read to us, my name is Mob. What a, what, what, a, what a word to have to wrestle with today, Mob. If you've been watching the January 6th hearings on TV this week. The man says, my name is, is Legion. My name is Mob. My name is Thousand. The, the editorial remark here in, in the Gospels is that he said this. Other people, other writers put the words in his own mouth. I am legion for we are many. Um, to, uh, the editorial remark is his name was thousands because he was tormented by many demons. By um, Technically a thousand, a legion was about 3,000 or 4,000 soldiers. Now, legion here can refer to the number of, of demons that tormented this man. And, and we, can, we can kind of see that playing out in the gospel story. But what if this person says he is thousands because he knows he is one of many? It's, we, we kind of try to stay safe reading this text um, to say that, that legion refers to the number of demons that were attacking this person. But what if we're also talking about the number of victims? Here we have a story in the Gospels of legion who lives in the cemetery. Legion lives in the cemetery. Thousands are they in the valley of the shadow of death. Legion lives in the cemeteries and we know their name. We know the name Layla Salazar and her 18 fourth grade classmates and her two teachers who were killed in their school in Uvalde, Texas. We know the name Ruth Whitfield and nine fellow grocery shoppers in Buffalo, New York, who were victims of gun violence. 
And this week we learned the name Walter Rainey and two of his friends from church in the suburbs of Birmingham, Alabama. They all have names. They all are somebody's child. They each are somebody's child. And for many of them, there is a father today who misses them. Painful. And we hurt, too. We can't help but hurt. We can't help but agonize over this pain. Because Jesus has shown up in our own lives to teach not only that we are God's children, but they are, too. And a tormented soul calls Jesus by name. And our tormented souls call Jesus by name. And he pulls up to shore in the midst of all this chaos. And we yell at him, Jesus, son of the most high God, what do you have to do with me? We show him all the mess. We show him the agony. We show him the names on the headstones where we find ourselves living today. And we say, what do you have to do with this? We show him every injustice a legion of times. What do you have to do with this, Jesus? Let's call him by name. What do you have to do with this, God saves? And Jesus' reply is everything. Jesus comes into the midst of this chaos, knowing everybody's name. And he shows up to do something about it. And we go with him. This picture of Jesus crossing the Sea of Galilee should have a lot of, of social scandal attached to it. Because on the other side of the lake in Galilee, folks would have told him, you don't go over there. You don't go across the lake. That's their side, and this is our side. There are Gentiles over there, and they have no part of us, and we have no part with them. And yet here we see Jesus crossing. Jesus crosses that boundary, a huge boundary of water, to go and carry the good news to other people. And we go with him. The lesson we learn is that God's people aren't confined to just one location that we set boundaries around. The love of God has no boundaries. And Jesus shows up and helps this young man call out an atrocity. Don't let the, the political scandal be missed here in, in your gospel reading. For, for Luke to put that word legion out there is a political challenge to the Roman armies that occupied their world. 
the problem with Rome wasn't just on the Jewish side of the lake. Their neighbors across the sea had the same problem. And the same problem was that they were occupied by a force of an army from Rome who demanded that everybody call their emperor God. So don't miss that Jesus is actually involved in something political here. He goes across the lake and he calls out an atrocity. We have to do that as well. If we, if we go to Jesus, to these places where <clears throat> our folks have told us we had better not go, he will actually probably get us into some trouble. You know, Congressman John Lewis called it good trouble. But today, as children of God, we know the names of other children of God who have died in senseless acts of violence. And our own government has the power to do something about it if they will act. The voters have something to do with that if they will call their leaders and say, do something. It's hard not to feel cynical about it. It's hard not to feel like we should just camp out in the cemetery. See, the trouble with Jesus showing up and calling out the atrocity is that he cast it into something else. And all those pigs go running down the hill and drown themselves in the sea. And the folks from town finally come out and they notice the wrong things. How many of them actually saw their child clothed and in his right mind? And how many of them only notice the economic impact of making things right? I think they told Jesus to leave because they couldn't afford to replace the pigs. We've got politicians making more money on pork and they care more about that pig than they do about the lives of our children. That needs to be called out. 3,000, 4,000 times over. <clears throat> and here was their own son, right there, he was healed. He clothed and in his right mind, the, the scriptures tell us. A beautiful sight. Probably something that every person in his hometown, his parents, his family, his little league coach, they wanted to see this. And the man wants to get in the boat and go back across the sea with Jesus. And I don't blame him because I get the feeling that his own home community might have let him down to see him out there in the cemetery. And yet Jesus knows that his own community needs this man. They need him to show up and recall all the good things that God has done for them. He sends him back home. Jesus also sends us back to those communities that need to hear from us, back to those communities that need us to declare what God is doing, to talk about all the things that God has done through Jesus. 
We get a little bit afraid of the word testimony, but that's what we're talking about. To put that word out there into the places that need to hear it, to talk about all that Jesus has done. And when we do, Jesus has everything to do with it. Jesus has everything to do with us and with those communities that we share the good news. Jesus has everything to do with it, and it changes people's lives. Jesus has everything to do with it, and it restores the outcast to community. Jesus has everything to do with it, and he gives people new names. And when we really know who Jesus is, we get that new name. He writes his name on our souls and makes us the children of God. Amen. Jesus, name of the Lord. And we'll sing it through twice. same mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself and became a slave and being born in human likeness and found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. 